Well, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, I think I'm gonna get uh, going uh, to introduce you uh, to Michelle Montaigne, the essays. First, I would like to share with you how I found uh, this book or rather how the book found me. Last year, last summer, I was looking for a book for one of my friends who was and still so much into um, uh, a particular uh, person, Rudolf Steiner. And I thought that I wanted to find a very, very old, old book, not like the new ones, because I was sure that he was having a, a series of his uh, publications. So I went to um, a, a bookstore, a really small one with lots of antique books, and I was browsing in a sociology section and history and philosophy. And I asked the shopkeeper if uh, uh, she knew about um, uh, the particular book I was looking for on Steiner, and she said no. So I was looking, and there was a book, my eyes caught, and I get going back to it uh, often and often. So I picked it up. And I started to read it and I thought, who is this Montaigne? Who is this, who is this person? And this is actually the book itself. And I started to read it as I was in the, in the bookstore. And I thought, oh, this is really in interesting, short little stories. I like it. And I thought, hmm, probably he would like it too. So I bought the book and I sat in a park because I had some time and I started to read it. And I thought, this is brilliant. I'm not going to give it to him. I really rather keep it to myself. So I read the book cover to cover, and I thought that, well, this is the book I would like to uh, lecture on this year. So um, um, when I started to do some research uh, on this book, I realized that actually this small little book I was reading that was a compilation of uh, only selected essays. Uh, but actually, the original book is 107 chapters and over 700 pages. And when I spoke with uh, two of my French friends about it, one of them said that, wow, you are courageous. And the other one said that he is so hard to read. And I thought, really, why? This book I read, that was actually so easy to read. Until I, I got this book, which is the complete essays of Montaigne. And as you can see, this is super big. And I started to read it. And I realized that uh, my French friend was right because it was really, really difficult to read. Then I searched on and um, the book itself, uh, when Montaigne wrote it, was published in 1580. And uh, the translation I got was, uh, um, which was published, I think, in 1850. So from the old French was trans translated to old English. That's why it was so hard to read. Then I thought, I'm not going to read this book. So guys, if you any of you want to read an old English version of the essays, get this book. Otherwise, I'm going to put in the chat a link. Uh, here. This one is by Emmy Screech. This is actually one of the... Um, the best translation. So translation really, really matters a lot. And this is the book actually I used for this presentation. So for today, I'm going to introduce you to, uh, to the author uh, and what led him to uh, write this wonderful book, because I do think it is a wonderful book. And at the end, I'm going to read you three short essays of his. And next time in December, the last presentation of this great books course and this book, I'm going to introduce you to only one essay and together we're going to discuss it and dissect it. So as always, I planned a um, PowerPoint presentation, uh, which I'm going to uh, start now. Yeah, this is the one. So here we go. Michel Montaigne was one of the most significant philosophers of the French Renaissance, known for popularizing the essay as a literary genre. His work is noted for its merging of casual anecdotes and autobiography with serious intellectual insight. 
His massive volume essays contains some of the most influential essays ever written. He had a direct influence on writers all over the world, including Francis Bacon, René Descartes, Blaise Pascal, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Friedrich Nietzsche, Isaac Asimov, William Shakespeare, and Stefan Zweig. The latter, who in flight from Nazism, turned first of all to Montaigne writing. Montaigne helps us answer this one question, how to stay free, how to preserve our inborn clear-mindedness in front of all the threats and dangers of fanaticism and how to preserve the humanity of our hearts among the upsurge of bestiality. In the 17th century, when an educated nobility set the tone, he was chiefly admired for his portrayal of the well-educated, non-pedantic man of manners, as much as at home, in a salon, as in his study, a gentleman of smiling wisdom and elegant, discreet disenchantment. I can see that there is a question. Do you mind if actually I look at it at the end, if it, unless it's urgent? In the same period, however, religious authors such as Blaise Pascal deplored his skepticism as anti-Christian and denounced what they interpreted as an immoral self-absorption. In the pre-revolutionary 18th century, the image of a dogmatically irreligious Montaigne continued to be dominant and Voltaire and Denis Diderot saw in him a precursor of the free thought of the Enlightenment. For Jean-Jacques Rousseau, however, the encounter with the essays was differently and fundamentally important, as he rightly considered Montaigne the master and the model of the self-portrait. Rousseau inaugurated the perception of the book as the entirely personal project of a human being in search of his identity and unafraid to talk without dissimulation about his profound nature. In the 19th century, some of the old misunderstandings continued, but there was a growing understanding and appreciation of Montaigne, not only as a master of ideas, but also as the writer of the particular, the individual, the intimate, the writer as friend and familiar. Gustave Flaubert kept the essays on his bedside table and recognized in Montaigne an alter ego. Today, Montaigne continues to be studied in all aspects of his text by great numbers of scholars and to be read by people from all corners of this planet. In an age that may seem as violent and absurd as his own, his refusal of intolerance and fanaticism and his lucid awareness of the human potential for destruction, coupled with his belief in the human capacity for self-assessment, honesty, and compassion, appeal as convincingly as ever to the many who find in him a guide and a friend. During his lifetime, Montaigne was admired more as a statesman than as an author. The tendency in his essays to digress into anecdotes and personal reflections was seen as detrimental to proper style rather than as an innovation. And his declaration that I am myself, the matter of my book, was viewed by his contemporaries as self-indulgent. In time, however, Montaigne came to be recognized as embodying perhaps better than any other author of his time, the spirit of freely entertaining doubt that began to emerge at that time. He's mostly famous, known for his skeptical remark, what do I know? Que sais-je? Montaigne was versatile. In one person, he embodied a teacher and a philosopher, a moralist, a literary man, a nobleman living in his castle, an active politician, a diplomat, a portrait painter, an excellent storyteller, 
a pioneer of researching Mars psychology, ethnographer, who possessed an agile mind with a profound interest in many things similar to Goethe, who will be in 200 years. But above all, he was a writer. In his books, the reader finds that he was ahead of its time regarding reflections and ideas such as opposition to duels and torture, in schools and in homes, the physical abuse of children, being shocked of the rulers having unlimited power, and even missing the small ads section in newspapers. Montaigne was born in 1533 in the Aquitaine region of France on the family estate Chateau de Montaigne in a town now called Saint-Michel de Montaigne, close to Bordeaux. The family was very wealthy. His great-grandfather, Ramon Philippe Aquin, had made a fortune as a herring merchant and had bought the estate in 1477, thus becoming the Lord of Montaigne. His father, Pierre Aquin, seigneur of Montaigne, was a French Catholic soldier in Italy for a time and had also been the mayor of, mayor of Bordeaux. His father's and mother's family are thought to have had some degree of Spanish, Portuguese, Jewish, and French origins. During a great part of Montaigne's life, his mother lived near him and even survived him, but she is mentioned only twice in his essays. His relationship with his father, however, is frequently reflected upon and discussed in his essays. His education began in early childhood and followed a pedagogical plan that his father had developed, which meant that soon after his birth, Montaigne was brought to a small cottage where he lived the first three years of his life in the sole company of a peasant family in order to draw the boy close to the people and to the life conditions of the people who need our help, so he said. After these first Spartan years, Montaigne was brought back to the chateau. Another objective of his education was for Latin to, be to become his first language. His father hired a German tutor who didn't speak French, and his servants could only speak only in Latin to the young boy. Montaigne's Latin education was accompanied by constant intellectual and spiritual stimulation. He was familiarized with Greek by a pedagogical method that employed games, conversation, and exercises of solitary meditation rather than the more traditional books. The atmosphere of the boy's upbringing engendered in him a spirit of liberty and delight that he would later describe as making him relish duty by an unforced will and of my own voluntary motion without any severity or constraint, he said. His father had a musician wake Montaigne, the little boy, every morning playing one instrument or another. Not bad, is it? At a tender age of seven, Montaigne was sent to study at a highly regarded boarding school in Bordeaux, the Collège of Guienne, then under the direction of the greatest Latin scholar of the era, Georges Buchanan, where he mastered the whole curriculum by his 13th year. After having finished the first phase of his educational studies at the Collège, he then began his study of law and entered a career in a local legal system. Montaigne was a counselor of the Cour des Aides of Perigo, and in 1557, he was appointed counselor of the parliament in Bordeaux, a high court. From 1561 to 63, he was the courtier at the court of Charles IX, and he was present with the king at the siege of Rouen in 1562. He was awarded the highest honor of the French nobility, the color of the Order of Saint-Michel. 
While serving at the Bordeaux Parliament, he became a very close friend of the humanist poet Etienne de la Boitier, whose death in 1563 deeply affected Montaigne. It has been suggested by Donald M. Frame in his introduction to the complete essays of Montaigne that because of, the, of Montaigne's imperious need to communicate, after losing Etienne, he began the essays as a new means of communication and that the reader takes the place of the dead friend. Montaigne married Françoise de la Cassaigne in 1565, probably in an arranged marriage. She was the daughter and the niece of wealthy merchants of Toulouse and Bordeaux. They had six daughters, but only the second born, Leonor, survived infancy. He wrote very little about the relationship with his wife and little is known about their marriage. Montaigne lived through and wrote at the height of the French wars of religion. The French wars of religion is the term which is used in reference to a period of civil war between French Catholics and the Protestants, commonly called Huguenots, which lasted from 1562 to 1598. According to estimates, between two and four million people died from violence, famine, or diseases, which were directly caused by the conflict. Additionally, the conflict severely damaged the power of the French monarchy. The fighting ended in 1598 when Henry of Navarre, who had converted to Catholicism in 1593, was pro proclaimed Henry IV of France and issued the Edict of Nantes, which granted substantial rights and freedoms to the Huguenots. However, the Catholics continued to have a hostile opinion of Protestants in general, and they also continue to have a hostile opinion of him as a person, and his assassination in 1610 triggered a fresh round of Huguenot rebellions in 1620s. Tensions between the two religions had been building since the 1530s, exasperating existing regional divisions. The death of Henry II of France in July in 1559 initiated a prolonged struggle for power between his widow, Catherine de' Medici, and powerful nobles. These included a fervently Catholic faction led by the Guise and the Montmorency families, and Protestants headed by the House of Condé and Jean d'Albert. Both sides received assistance from external powers. Spain and Savoy supported the Catholics while England and the Dutch Republic backed the Protestants. Moderates, also known as politique, hoped to maintain order by centralizing power and making concessions to Huguenots rather than the policies of repression pursued by Henry II and his father Francis I. They were initially supported by Catherine de' Medici, whose January 1562 Edict of Saint-Germain was strongly opposed by the Guise faction and led to the outbreak of the widespread fighting in March. She later hardened her stance and backed the 1572 saint Bartholomew's Day massacre in Paris, which resulted in Catholic mobs killing between 5,000 and 30 30,000 Protestants throughout France. The wars threatened the authority of the monarchy and the last Valois kings, Catherine's three sons, Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. Their Bourbon successor, Henry IV, responded by creating a strong central state and extending toleration to Huguenots. The latter policy would last until 1685, when Louis XIV of France revoked the Edict of Nantes. In 1570, Montaigne retired from the public life to the tower of the chateau, his so-called citadel, where he almost totally isolated himself from every social and family affair. 
logged up in his library, which contained a collection of some 1,500 works, he began work on his essays. At this stage, he considered himself as a Stoic. He admired the Roman Cato and Seneca, and his letters to Lucilius aphorisms appear a lot in his newly forming book. Sextus and Piricus's work has a big effect on Montaigne especially about skepticism, so much so that in 1576, he wears a coin or pendant which depicts two pens which are equally balanced and has a text around it saying, que sais je, what do I know? His thinking led later on to anchor his boat at the shores of the Epicurean living, a joyous life approach. His philosophy, did not become in a speculative way. He did study very many schools of philosophies and philosophers, and in parallel with those, he observed the open book of the multifaceted reality. The long years of the horrible wars of France made him realize that being generous and forgiving, as well as being uncertain, is better way to live. He decided not to give in to vanity, and ambition, fear and worries, and only listens to his inner forum, his inner voice. In his view, individualism is just as an extremity as being an unbeliever, so he chooses to remain a Catholic. Montaigne died at the age of 59, in 1592 at the Chateau Montaigne. The disease brought about paralysis of the tongue, especially difficult for one who once said, the most fruitful and natural play of the mind is conversation. I find it sweeter than any other action in life. And if I were to force to choose, I think I would rather lose my sight than my hearing and voice, he said remaining in possession of all his other faculties, he requested mass and he died during the celebration of that mass. An essay is an essay. It is intangible, floating and malleable that reveals its secrets only if we give up on to define it. As Montaigne was perfect in Latin, probably he had heard to the original Latin exagium, which means deliberation and consideration, be that about a person or humanity or an idea or art or an event, and whether these related opinions are correct or not. It is interesting to know that in 1972, the Petit Larousse defined the essay that it denotes certain reflections that the author does not want to detail in great detail. An essay may not provide sure or definite answers to a question or questions. In other words, it may not be a rigid study. It is not fiction. It rather is in between philology and prose expressed in a literary style. It may contain more of spontaneous elements than an academic paper, which has lots of scholarly terminologies and data. An essay informs and creates a discussion with the reader. A great essayist records momentary understandings and views influences and creates new, and not just learns and researches, but offers experience while guides in important matters. The book, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, was originally written in three books and 107 chapters of varying length, covering a wide range of topics. Montaigne revised the books over 20 years, and in his work, they were to record some traits of my character and of my humors. The essays were published first in 1580. Although Montaigne certainly knew the classical philosophers, 
His ideas spring less out of their teaching than out of the completely original meditation on himself, which he extends to a description of the human being and to an ethics of authenticity, self-acceptance and tolerance. The essays are the record of his thoughts presented not in artif artificially organized stages, but as they occurred and reoccurred to him in different shapes throughout his thinking and writing activity. They are not the record of an intellectual evolution, but of a continuous accumulation. And he insists on the immediacy and the authenticity of their testimony. His arguments are often supported with quotations from ancient Greek, Latin, and Italian texts by Lucretius and the works of Plutarch. Furthermore, his essays were seen as an important contribution to both writing form and skepticism. As I pointed out before, the title itself comes from the French, French word essays, or the Latin, meaning attempts or tests which shows how this new form of writing did not aim to educate or prove. Rather, his essays were exploratory journeys in which he works through logical steps to bring skepticism to what is being discussed. Montaigne's stated goal in his book is to describe himself with utter frankness and honesty. The insight into human nature provided by his essays, for which they are so widely read, is merely a byproduct of his introspection. Though the implications of his essays were profound and far-reaching, he did not intend or suspect that his work would garner much attention outside of his inner circle, prefacing his essays with, I am myself the matter of this book. You would be unreasonable to suspend your leisure on so frivolous and vain a subject. Montaigne's essays topics span the entire spectrum of the profound to the trivial, with titles ranging of sadness and sorrow, the art of conversation, of conscience, of smells, of posting, etc. He never found certainty in any of his inquiries into the nature of man and things, despite his best efforts and many attempts. He mistrusted certainty of both human reason and experience. He reasoned that while a human is finite, truth is infinite. Thus, human capacity is naturally inhibited in grasping reality in its fullness or with certainty. Though he did believe in the existence of absolute truth, he believed that such truth could only be arrived at by human through divine revelation. He finds the great variety and volatility of human nature to be its most basic features, which resonates with Renaissance thought about the fragility of humans. Montaigne believes that humans cannot attain certainty. His philosophical skepticism is best expressed in a long essay, An Apology for Raymond Siebund. He posits that we cannot trust our reasoning because thoughts just occur to us. We do not truly control them. Further, he says we do not have good reasons to consider ourselves superior to animals. He is highly skeptical of confessions obtained under torture pointing out that such confessions can be made up by the sub suspect just to escape the torture to which he is subjected. He also eloquently employed many references and quotes, not just from the classical Greek and Roman authors, but from non-Christian authors, especially the atomist Lucretius. He considered marriage necessary for the raising of children, but disliked the strong feelings of romantic love as being detrimental to freedom. One of his quotations is, marriage is like a cage. One sees the birds outside desperate to get in and those inside desperate to get out. 
in education, he favored concrete examples and experience over the teaching of abstract knowledge that is expected to be accepted uncritically. He opposed European colonization of the Americas, deploring the suffering it brought upon the natives. The book's contents are nothing like a typical philosophy book. He wanted to talk about many things that never gets mentioned in philosophy books, the ordinary, everyday things about life, to encourage us to accept the ordinary in ourselves. That is why he mentions about the penis, bowel movements, the impotence and farting. He thought that the body was not mentioned in philosophy books because people thought of it as embarrassing and shameful. Montaigne drew attention how much humans have a lot in common with the animal world. Kings and philosophers shit, he reminded us, and so do ladies. He observed that animals are much more relaxed with their bodies than humans are. His intention in this regard was that people should accept themselves more, just like animals do. He traveled in Europe in order to broaden his mind, to understand cultural prejudice, and to enable him to see more clearly how narrow the minds can be. He met the Pope, met prostitutes, he met people of all denominations, he went to synagogues and Protestant churches, and he always asked everybody he met about their way of life. He wanted to understand how people decided what is good and what is bad. He also discussed intellectual aspects of one's being. The kind of intelligence he was keen on is called wisdom. He reportedly said that one could be wise without ever having gone to university. All you need is a certain amount of modesty, humility, and the acceptance of your intellectual limitations. He did not say that all learning was useless. He was simply observing the people who go to universities are not any happier or wiser than those who do not. Education systems in Montaigne's time and quite so in ours too, apart from ubiquity university, do not prepare students for life, do not have exams in wisdom, but rather in regurgitating what they read in textbooks. Academic qualifications are not the chief or sole determinants of one's intelligence. There are ways of being clever that top universities do not recognize. Montaigne was against intellectual arrogance and said that even in the highest throne we sit on our asses. Do not be wiser than necessary. Be wise in moderation, says on one of the ceiling beams in the top of his chateau room where he was writing. There is nothing more certain than uncertainty, says another wooden beam text. In short, in Montaigne's understanding, it is adequate of a human being to speak no Greek, change one's mind often, get bored with a book, be impotent, and know pretty much none of the ancient philosophers. A virtuous ordinary life, striving for wisdom, but never far from craziness is achievement enough. We yourself, a British writer said that Montaigne was a proto-blogger. When you read Montaigne, you know that you are with a late Renaissance mind immediately because the way in which he thinks about what it is to know about things, and he thinks about what it is to know things absolutely solidly within the context of classical understanding and classical knowledge. Often substantiating his arguments in Latin by ancient wisdom. We understand the world not as theoretical physicists would ask us to, as a mathematical construct that we can apprehend from the outside, 
And we do not necessarily understand it, perhaps as poets would like us to understand it, as a series of elusive and metaphoric remarks from which we move to understand the metaphor. We understand it absolutely as agents, and we understand it not only that, but as actors in the drama of our own mind. The reader gets the feeling through the essays that the author sees through the pretensions of power in all its forms and the kind of vanities of the world. Now let's see some of his quotes. There are plenty in the book. In that over 700 pages, you will find a lot, but I only designated only a few for today. I quote others only in order to better express myself. There were never in the world two opinions alike, any more than two hairs or two grains. Their most universal quality is diversity. Lend yourself to others, but give yourself to yourself. Our life is composed like the harmony of the world of discourse as well as different tones, sweet and harsh, sharp and flat, soft and loud. And on the highest throne in the world, we still sit only on our own bottom. He who fears, he will suffer already suffers because he fears. Nothing fixes a thing so intensely in the memory as the wish to forget it. It is the mind that maketh good or ill, that maketh wretch or happy, rich or poor. Well, this is so true as well, how the Aristotelian sage learned to moderate their emotions. And now we're going to turn, I'm going to stop screen share. And uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce three very short essays just to get the taste of it, because I really hope that you're going to uh, read, if not the whole, but part of the book. So I, I selected, I think, maybe three or four, and uh, I look forward to your comments on these. This is actually, uh, I took, I rather copied them from the book uh, I put in the text, the M.A. Screech translation. And at most um, uh, essays, or rather at the beginning, he provides a little overview just to uh, set the context. And this is on writing in post. So these are the uh, translator words first. From the early 16th century, Generals and statesmen laid posts, at first temporary ones, but later permanent ones, along the post roads. At each post stage, horses were kept, and it was the duty of the postmaster or courier to ride at all speed to the next post with the dispatches or post. To ride in post meant to ride literally as such a postman or else at express speed as a sport, normally in relay races. It was the sport which Montaigne used to be good at. The military, political, and financial advantages of rapid communication also led to the reintroduction of career pigeons into Europe. Now let's turn to the words of the author Montaigne. I have not been one of the weakest at this sport, which is suited to men of my stocky short build, but I am giving up such business. It makes too great an essay of our strength to keep it up for long. I was reading just now 
that King Cyrus, in order to facilitate the reception of news from all parts of his very wide empire, found out how far horses could get in a day at one stretch, and then at such distances stationed men with responsibility for holding horses in readiness to furnish to those who were traveling to see him. Some maintain that the speed of such journeys is that of the crane in flight. Caesar said that Lucius Vibulus Rufus was hurrying to bring a warning to Pompeii. He remained night and day on the road, changing horses so as to travel more swiftly. And according to Suetonius, Caesar himself covered a hundred miles a day in a higher chariot. But he was a mad courier, for whenever rivers cut across his road, he swam across them, turning off neither left nor right to search for a bridge or a ford. When Tiberius Nero went to see his brother Drusus, who was ill in Germany, he covered 200 miles in 24 hours in three chariots. Livy says that during the war which the Romans fought against King Antiochus, Titus Sempronius Gracchus, using relays of horses, traveled on the third day with almost unbelievable speed from Amphissa to Pella. And if you look at the context, it is clear that it refers to permanent posts, not once newly established for the tribe. Even faster was Cacenius' new way of sending news to those at home. He took swallows with him, which he released to fly back to their nests whenever he wished to send his news home, staining them with the colored mark appropriate to his message according to a code which he had agreed on with his family. In the Roman theaters, the pater familias kept pigeons in the breast of his toga and attached messages to them whenever he wished to ask those at home to do something for him. They were moreover trained to bring back the answers. Decimus Brutus made use of them when under siege at Mutina, others have done so elsewhere. In Peru, the couriers rode on men who bore them in litters on their shoulders with such agility that the first porters relayed their burden to the next team at the run without missing a step. I have been given to understanding that the Valations, the couriers of the Grand Seigneur, make the fastest speeds of all, since they have the right to force anyone whom they meet traveling on their road to dismount and to exchange his horse for their exhausted one, and also because they wear a tight broad band around their waist to stop them from tiring as quite a few others do. I have found no relief in this method. So the next one is on thumbs. And here are the words of the translator. Renaissance etymologies are often very fanciful, but in the case of the French and Latin words for thumb, pus, or legs, Philologists today continue to accept the derivations advanced by Montaigne and his contemporaries. Our own word, thumb, derives also, it seems, from Sanskrit word meaning the strong one. And here are Montaigne's words on this subject. Tacitus relates that it was the custom among certain barbarian kings to make a treaty binding by pressing their right hands together and interlocking their thumbs until they had squeezed the blood to their tips, whereupon they likely pricked them with a needle and sucked each other's blood. Doctors say that our thumb is our master finger and that our French word for it, pus, derives from a Latin verb, 
all era to excel in strength. The Greeks called it anticher, another hand, so to speak. And the Latins seems occasionally to use it to mean the whole of the hand. Neither sweet words of the pers persuasion nor the help of her thumb can get it erect. In Rome, it was a sign of approval to turn your thumbs up or down. The Romans exempted from war service those who had injured thumbs since they could no longer firmly grasp their weapons. Augustus confiscated the estates of a Roman knight who had craftily cut off the thumb of two of his sons to stop them being mobilized into the army. Before that, during the Italian wars, the Senate had sentenced Caius Votenius to life imprisonment and confiscated all his estates for having deliberately cut off his left thumb to get out of an expedition. Some generals or other, I cannot remember his name, cut off the thumb of his defeated enemies after winning a naval engagement so as to deprive them of the means of fighting and of pulling on the oar. The Athenians did the same to the men of Aegina to deprive them of their naval superiority. In Sparta, the schoolmaster punished his pupils by biting their thumbs. Now the next one is on idleness. Here there is no forward by the translator. Just as follow lands, when rich and fertile, are seen to abound in hundreds and thousands of different kinds of useless weeds, so that if we would make them do their duty, we must subdue them and keep them busy with seeds specifically sown for our service. And just as women left alone may sometimes be seen to produce shapeless lumps of flesh, but need to be kept busy by a semen other than her own in order to produce good natural offspring, so too with our minds. If we do not keep them busy with some particular subject, which can serve as a bridle to rein them in, they charge ungovernably about ranging to and fro over the wastelands of our thoughts. As when ruffled water in a bronze pot reflects the light of the sun and the shining face of the moon, sending shimmers flying high into the air and striking against the paneled ceilings. Then there is no madness, no raving lunacy, with such agitations do not bring forth their fashion vain apparitions as in the dreams of sick man. When the soul is without a definite aim, she gets lost. For, as they say, if you are everywhere, you are nowhere. Recently, I retired to my estates, determined to devote myself as far as I could to spending what little life I have left quietly and privately. It seemed to me then that the greatest favor I could do for my mind was to leave it in total idleness, caring for itself, concerned only with itself, calmly thinking of itself. I hoped it could do that more easily from then on, since with the passage of time, it had grown mature and put on weight. But I find idleness always produces fickle changes of mind that on the contrary, it bolted off like a runaway horse, taking far more trouble over itself than it ever did over anyone else. It gives birth to so many chimeras and fantastic monstrosities, one after another, without order or fitness, that so as to contemplate at my ease their oddness and their strangeness, I began to keep a record of them hoping in time to make my mind ashamed of itself. 
Now, the very last one, which is really short, I promise, is actually an excerpt of the, um, the fairly long essay called The Art of Conversation. And I actually um, got this part because Clearly, it was very relevant in the in the in the 1550s, and it is so relevant today. I wonder if you actually can can find some parallels, but I did so for sure. So this is what Montaigne said: Look and see who wield the most power in our cities, who do their jobs best. You will find that they are usually the least clever. There have been cases when women, children, and lunatics have ruled their states equally as well as the most talented princes. Coarse men more usually succeed in such things, says Thucydides, better than the subtle ones do. We ascribe the deeds of their good fortune to their wisdom. Each outstanding man is raised by his good fortune. We then say that he is clever. That is why I insist that in all our activities, their outcomes provide meager testimony of our worth and ability. Now I was just about to say that it merely suffices for us to see a man raised to great dignity, even though we knew him three days before to be a negligible man, there seeps into our opinions, unawares, a notion of greatness, of talents, and we convince ourselves that by growing in style and reputation, he has grown in merit. Our judgments of him are not based on his worth, but, as is the case with the counters of an abacus, on the tokens of rank. Let his luck turn again. Let him have a fall and be lost in the crowd again. Then we all ask in wonder, what had made him soar so high? Is this the same man, we ask? Did he not know more about it when he was up there? Are princes satisfied with so little? We were in good hands, indeed we were. That is something I have seen many times in my own days. Why? Even the mask of greatness, which is staged in our plays, affects us somewhat and deceives us. What I worship in kings in a crowd of their worshippers. Everything should bow and submit to our kings except our intelligence. My reason was not made for bending and bowing, my knees were. Oh, well, thank you so much for listening. I think I would like to stop here and uh, leave some more for next time. Um, nah. Okay, sorry, that was the chat. And there is something in a question and then... Uh, sorry, Dave, everything is okay. Uh, okay. So if you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you. Um, have you read uh, any part of the book? Or if you haven't, uh, what's, what's your take on it uh, based on uh, my presentation? Dave, you always have something to say. What do you think about this book so far? Have you come across it before? Hi, Georgie. Uh, Hello, Dave. How are you? Sorry to I'm gonna put you the, you know, the, under the spotlight, but I'm really interested in your comments. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I got interrupted with a phone call. My, my wife's in Ontario and she's sick, so... Oh, I heard so about uh, three quarters of what you said. Really enjoyed it. I have not read the book, but uh, fascinating description of who Montaigne was in terms of his um, his insights as to how he functions and how people function. 
mm -hmm. reminds me very much of myself. So I am very intrigued uh, to to go read the book. Oh, uh, fantastic! Moment, I've, I've got a huge amount of reading because I'm I'm doing a a master of theological studies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, over Christmas, I'll, I'll dig the boat, book out and and uh, and have a look at it. Oh, wonderful! Well, I I, I really I must say that I really love short uh, short stories, uh, and so these essays are definitely for me. So maybe that's one of the reasons why this book. Uh, found me but but also it is really incredible i think that this you know montaigne wrote this book in in the 1500s and uh, and 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 clearly there is so much very much the same is done in our days right the self uh, reflection Absolutely. and uh, you know the uh, you know self blogging you know or vlogging so and 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 he was doing that so it's i think and, and it's when i started to research it it was really incredible to read um, that how highly regarded uh, his his work is and what he introduced to the world and and he really really influenced not just scholars academics politicians and uh, you know or those who are not interested in any of those matters at all and 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 it is true that uh, that he he I believe that he creates sort of discussion um, with uh, with with the reader. I found myself kind of like smiling. Probably you saw my 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 spies as I was reading some of some of these short uh, essays, and uh, and he can be super funny. And of course, some of the the Latin or, or Greek um, quotations I didn't. Uh, read i didn't uh, insert in these uh, short essays because first i don't know how to pronounce them <laughs> and the second it's not that important anyway so thank you so much and i i, I pray that uh, your wife gets better uh, soon thank yeah. you dave anyway th thanks george i'll see you next next month as well yeah thank you so much look forward to thank you um anybody laura dear laura or or eric there is something in the chat from jonathan this book was required reading for my freshman oh my goodness really this was a required reading wow that's incredible ah okay so interesting that uh it comes back to you. I don't know. Would you consider reading it? <laughs> or maybe part of it, or it's just good that you you listen to um, my monologues on him. That's that's good enough. Susu dear, let's hear from you. Hi everyone. Hello. Hi. Um. Thank you very much for this presentation. I, I'm stick to this word essay, and um, I was only saying that essays in that time is maybe some kind of our new social interactions, like Instagram um, for today's days, and um, yeah, maybe. A few days later, a few years later, um, our our yeah our mm -hmm. Instagram sayings will be translated in mm -hmm. in next generation. So it is it's very interesting that they had they had this very modern and um, very far forward forward um, yes ideas and conversation styles in 1500 mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm. no, thank you so much that's a very interesting point um at, uh, nowadays yeah like oh the texts uh, we send to each other is so so short and uh, full of abbreviations and uh, emojis and uh, goodness yeah where, where is where is language going in that regard or rather self-expression <laughs> mm -hmm. but it, it is i don't know if there was anybody else before him who followed the same genre i.e this kind of like essay type uh, or other just little nuggets as jim would call it unfortunately he is not with us uh, hopefully he will be with us uh, in december um, but it is i think I, um, I i like it very much i think it's a, it's a different uh, type of um, thought process mm -hmm. isn't it and uh, it makes you think in a, in a different way like there is 
it's almost like the two paradigms meet in one that, uh, in a sense, or rather the, the two end of the spectrum that there is, there is the the depth, there is the 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 profundity, and at the same time there is there is no conclusion. You make the conclusion, or it's almost like yes, it is almost like talking to a friend, you know, at a, at, at in a coffee house, and uh, and that's that's what I felt uh, so many times. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today and and, and listening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There any uh, anybody else would like to share any thoughts? Eric, is there anything? Oh, Laura, hello, dear. Hello. Hello. Hi. How, oh, I, I so you? I'm very well, thank you. I could only listen um, intermittently and couldn't give it all my attention um, because we were out and about and we had it on, on our phone. Both Mick and I were listening, and uh -huh. he he is so inspired hearing you that uh, he's going to start reading about Montaigne. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, <laughs> he so didn't know. Yeah, he did know about him, but I think it refreshed his uh, appreciation oh, of his. Goodness. Yeah, and I was so struck. I don't think I knew about him at all. Mm. So I'm so glad you chose this um, fantastic mm -hmm. thinker. And he he is way ahead of his time. I feel he's a very integral thinker um, in, yeah. in you know, the sort of Ken Wilber style of understanding that. And mm -hmm. he he had a place for things like as he's speaking, you know, is what is intelligence? He he is such a questioning mind, yeah. but he was so um, not arrogant in his brilliant brilliance, which yeah. I think allowed him to touch many many areas of life, and that mm. that's very very integral. Like the whole. So anyway, that's what I was struck with just um, just hearing what the quotes you were saying and what you were saying about him and yeah thank you so much well, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased that your dear man is going to read the book definitely make sure that he's going to read the the ma screech translation because otherwise really it you know the the other book that i was i'm going to use it as i don't know something <laughs> okay <laughs> oh, no display because it's really it's kind of like depressive because like oh my gosh i thought i speak english well read english but this old english is super tough that's why my french friend said that, oh gosh you know you're very courageous probably they read a, a really right. um, difficult yeah. translation so it really goes to show that how translations matter and it makes a difference like one translation is different to another one which we know about it but it's clearly is very very apparent for this book I can <laughs> okay so a more uh, what's the translation you used yeah I put it in the in the chat the very okay. first thing that's an online okay. on, you can access it online but basically it's a penguin edition and uh, the complete essays and it is by 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 M.A. Screech and he's okay. really the best. so many scholars refer to him that this is just the best and uh, and I Screech. have been okay. I have been uh, comparing his translation to another two and 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 really is 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 the best yeah awesome thank you okay yeah, thank you so much and much love okay. to you. yeah, yeah you thank too. you and you Georgie bye bye and Eric said that he put a question, not so much a question, but I was intrigued with Montaigne's commenting on a body and emotions, and especially how philosophers had not really dealt with the body. So true. No, I think so, absolutely. I think he was he was so down to the point about that, that uh, that somehow, uh, especially that time, even, even now, I... Um, uh well i think that maybe in 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 our uh century the you know the money bind connection is so much more talked about it than than ever before he was certainly um uh, uh a torch bearer about uh, mentioning it and he was uh, maybe that's one of the reason why uh he had negative uh, comments not that he cared about it because he didn't he really he really wrote this book uh 
mostly to his own uh, pleasure like he's he's warning everybody right at the beginning as i read to you that like and if you don't want to read it don't read it that's fine <laughs> it's totally okay so uh i think we will talk about some of these things because many um many um scholars or other analysts um, termed him as a misogynist and um and uh, and how he was um yeah, he had some issues about uh, religion and uh, and so forth. But we will discuss some of these uh, next time. So I promise that will be a hopefully a, um, uh, well, it will be a different uh, presentation for sure. Uh, is there is something? Is there a short book you can suggest? One thousand five hundred pages, likely too much for now. Uh, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, um I don't know. I will think about I will I will I will check it out because I think there must be another penguin edition on selected essays. Uh probably um uh Leo always knows these type of uh, answers to, to questions, but I would say that maybe just search something on Amazon and uh and pick the one which has five stars <laughs> because the one actually I, I read that was in Hungarian and I really, really loved it. But also I'm very pleased that I have the, the complete essays, not the really depressive one, but more like the one I sent to you. And that's what I was uh, I was reading. But it's a different thing to read on, on a computer screen and different to hold uh, a book in, in one's hand. And I pr prefer the latter one. Um, so uh, sorry, that's my... Uh, uh, and Leo, what did you say? I seek in the reading of books only to please myself by an honest diversion. Yeah, that's a good one. There are so many amazing uh, lines in the in the book. Leo, have you read the book or maybe parts of it? Or maybe you will. How free you will. Leo, you want to talk? Maybe he doesn't want oh, to. Oh, there. Be now I, I'm on now. Hello. <laughs> you, know, I, 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 you know, I found, I have a collection of the great books. And, and um, this one, the one I picked uh, is still in the cellophane. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> so, I unwrapped it and I went to, I went to the essay on of of books because I like books. Yeah. And uh the, I'll read some more of that quote. Uh, okay. Or if I study, tis for no other science than what treats of the knowledge of myself and mm. instructs me how to die and how to live well. Mhm. Mm I do not bite my nails about the difficulties I meet with in my reading. After a charge or two, I give them over. Should mm -hmm. I insist upon them, I should both lose myself and time, for I have an impatient understanding that must be satisfied at first. What I do not discern at once is by persistence rendered more obscure. I do nothing without gaiety, continuation, and a too obstinate endeavor darkens, stupefies, and tires my judgment. <laughs> so he he reads at his pleasure, and he doesn't, uh, if it doesn't suit him, he moves on to something else. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, as I said in, in my little monologue at the, at the beginning, he's totally okay that, listen, if you, you know, one doesn't isn't defined by which university you went to it's rather like it's totally okay not to know any any you know antiquities or you know and you just be you know a, a compassionate and kind person that's just good enough so what is the version what is the uh publication that you got is it the complete uh, this is this is the uh a cotton translation edited by oh. hazlitt and that's so that's a very old translation that, and, that's the, that's and the, the one, one you provided is the 1991, the most modern translation readily yeah. available. 
Yeah, yeah, mine, the one I showed you, that's the cotton one as well. And, uh, whew, that's... <laughs> 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 that's that's a challenge at some point you know not throughout but uh for sure well thank you very much well, i look forward to uh to your comments uh, next time we we meet in a in a, in a month's time i will uh, as i mentioned uh, to you at uh, the beginning that i will introduce only one essay of his and really dissect it there is one special topic that is close to my heart and i look forward to uh your points of view and Jonathan and Susu and 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 whoever is going to join join us. Will, will you announce that essay today so we can no. read it? No, 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 no. Because I'm still working on it actually. Oh, okay. So much. Okay. Yeah, because to be honest, in two days actually I changed my mind and <laughs> uh, and I and I came up with something else. So um, and also there is something about it that when. That is the kind of like you know the unexpected because then your then your mind is 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 fresh and not maybe you know um, what's the word um, like pre-planned with with someone's answers. But I'm sure that it's it's quite a well-known uh, essay of his, and uh, probably in a month's time, I'm sure that you you have read it already. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for joining and uh, stay well and safe and enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again uh, the second Tuesday uh, in December. I just can't believe uh, this whole year has gone so fast. Um, and thank you so much, Georg, uh, for this uh, Zoom facilitation. As always, you're a master of it. And uh, all the very best to you. Take care. Bye-bye.